As I mentioned, we uh, created a new um, tradition at the medical school uh, a year ago with the uh, initiation of the last lecture, an appropriate recognition for the person who wins the medal for uh, distinguished teaching when the chancellor's awards are presented at convocation. And I'm just delighted uh, this afternoon to welcome Dr. Sheldon Benjamin uh, to give uh, this year's last lecture. Now, Mrs. Benjamin, Sheldon's mother is here, who has come here from Ohio. <laughs> Dr. Benjamin gets the privilege of giving this lecture to our entire community because for this year, he was selected as the best teacher in the medical school. Each year, I get the privilege of reviewing a number of dossiers from a committee of the faculty in which they recommend to me faculty members who should be selected for this award. Now, you knew already that he was pretty good. <laughs> We're telling you he's the best. And if it wasn't for you, he wouldn't be here. <laughs> We're going to use a very short video clip to introduce Dr. Benjamin. As education remains the hallmark of a university campus and teaching its greatest enabler, I shall again begin this year's procession of medal presentations with the Medal for Distinguished Teaching. It's a privilege to recognize an enthusiastic, gifted, sought-after teacher who's viewed as a consummate and inspiring role model and mentor. Please join me in recognizing this year's recipient of the Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Teaching, Dr. Sheldon Benjamin. <laughs> Dr. Benjamin. You are an internationally recognized leader in psychiatric education. Viewed by all as an outstanding residency program director, an excellent clinician and role model, a mentor for junior faculty, faculty leaders who are residency directors and all trainees, many have been impacted by your gifts as an educator. Having spent more than 25 years at our institution, you have impacted the lives of so many. You've been described as one of the most influential and accomplished psychiatric educators in the country, a futurist, who is a thought leader and an innovator. You are the creator of the Brain Card, a neuropsychiatric examination pocket reference for medical and allied health trainees right and it's practitioners. <laughs> He's telling me it's $14.99. <laughs> Others have commented that your teaching of clinical acumen shines and that careful systematic assessment is your modus operandi. You've been reported to say that neuropsychiatry's instrument is the mental status exam and that you favor a thorough assessment of arousal, orientation, attention, and perseverance, working verbal and visual spatial memory language and paralinguistic functions, praxis, calculation, constructional ability, agnosis, right hemisphere, and dis-executive syndromes. <laughs> your teaching and your example are memorable. Your curiosity and commitment have earned our respect. You've been recognized numerous times on our campus, in our commonwealth, and across the nation for your teaching. You have risen to the ranks of leadership within your specialty, and all the while, you've maintained your humility, your humor, and your humanity. Having both written and answered students' questions for years, you have excelled as an acceptable, accessible mentor to students and faculty alike. Sheldon, 
in recognition for your outstanding commitment to education of so many who have been your students. It's my privilege to invite you to present this year's campus-wide last lecture, a celebration of education that we have established to recognize the importance of teaching in all that we do. It will be a privilege for all of us on campus to benefit from your intellect and to become your students. Please accept my congratulation as this year's recipient of the Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Teaching. Well, Chancellor Collins, thank you very much for that uh, terrific introduction. And I've been on the faculty, as you've heard, more than 25 years, and I still can't believe that they pay me to come in and practice neuropsychiatry and teach it. It's the most fun you can have in medicine. And now an award for it, it's, uh, it's overwhelming. Well, the rules are that before I uh, present, I just have to give a uh, disclosure. And uh, I have a disclosure to make that's a potential conflict of interest. I'm one third owner of Brain Educators LLC, which is a neuropsychiatric medical publishing company. You saw me plug it when uh, Dr. Collins was talking to me on the podium. There. And it really does potent, uh, present a potential conflict of interest. I'll leave that to you. Um, so, Dr. Eckstein doesn't see anybody, she said. I was a uh, freshman at the University of Cincinnati um, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I was working part-time nights as a science librarian. And it was my habit to take a look through the books that people would return to see what they were into. <laughs> One day, someone returned a book called Lives. I have here. This isn't the one they returned. I never took anything from the library. And I opened it up and I read this. I had got to be a doctor, a man of science, and took a tiny creature, a thing so small it sat with comfort in the palm of my hand, cut into its skull and removed the tip of its brain. Science has not got much by that, but possibly a few rats have. For he taught me that little white rat and I've changed my mind about many things. The little white rat survived my cunning. There was no mutilation of any function that is commonly said to lodge in the brain. His thought was clear, his spirit brave. He could guide his body, and his length of life seemed even increased, for he reached what in our terms is a hundred years. Before I even went back to the carding desk, I was reshelving the book, and I sat there and read the first essay in this book, standing up by the, uh, by the bookshelves. And then I proceeded over the next several weeks to find everything I could by this author, Gustav Eckstein. The frontispiece of his books showed that he was a professor at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, unfortunately, four decades earlier. I wondered, does he still exist? Nobody knew. I asked about him. Nobody had heard of him in the college. And I was in the arts and sciences department. They should have known. I looked for an obituary. I couldn't find one. So I screwed up my courage, and I went across the street to the old medical school. Remember, I was a freshman in college here. I went into the dean's office, and I asked the secretary, by any chance, is there still a Professor Eckstein here? And she said, I'm sorry, Dr. Eckstein doesn't see anybody. Yes, I said. <laughs> First, she has just told me he's alive. And second, she's admitted that he is someplace in this building. <laughs> so I began to do my studying in the library at the old medical school. And there I got to know a librarian and um, asked her, what does she know about this guy, Eckstein? She says, I've never seen him. I've heard rumors about him. <laughs> there are stories about him. They say he used to have 100 free-flying canaries in his physiology laboratory. They say when he played Beethoven's Fifth on the Baby Grand in his physiology laboratory, with the window open, 
the canaries would fly back in the window and alight all over him as he played. <laughs> they say that when he did his physiology lab lectures, he also sometimes would sit down at the piano. But, she said, no one's ever seen him. <laughs> it's been years and years since he taught here. And I said, well, can you help me sort of figure out, you're a librarian, you know, or one librarian to another, can you help me find him? And she said, well, the rumor is that there's an office someplace in the science, in the physiology department. And I've once heard somebody say that they've seen him here late at night, maybe I'm working on his writing. And I said, late? And she said, very late. So then instead of studying in the medical school library, I went up to the physiology floor right from there, and I asked the secretary in the physiology department, by chance, is there a Professor Eckstein that has an office on this floor? And she said, Dr. Eckstein doesn't see anybody. <laughs> I said, I know, I've heard that. Um, and uh, I went over, and there was a list of all the doctors on the floor, and his name wasn't listed. After she had gone and people weren't around, I walked around the whole floor and found three doors that had no names on them, but I couldn't find his name on any. So I began studying on the floor of the physiology corridor <laughs> late at night by the coffee machine where I reasoned a late night writer would come to. And um, so I'd sit there with my books, and it was 11 o'clock at night. 12. I did this for a few nights, and nothing happened. I decided to come back a third night, and it was after midnight already. And I was sitting there doing the studying for some test or other, and um, an elderly gentleman with snow white hair, diminutive stature, came up to the coffee machine, and he puts a nickel in to get the toxic black fluid, and while he's looking at the coffee machine, he's looking at me askance. It didn't even occur to me that he would be nervous about me. After all, here it is, after midnight. I had long hair and a beard. I'm sitting in my jeans and tattered shirt on the floor alone in the middle of the night in the physiology department reading a book. And while he's at the coffee machine, I stand up. He started, and I said, would you be Professor Eckstein? And it didn't occur to me. He'd be frightened of me. And I was, I was about a foot and a half taller than him, too. And, and um, it absolutely didn't occur to me. And, and he said, and, and who's asking? And I proceeded to explain that I've been trying and trying to find you for well over a month now, and I just, I wanted to meet you. And he said, well, what do you want? And I said, well, I, I, I realized I had to have, I had been looking for him. It had never crossed my mind that I would actually find him. <laughs> and I hadn't actually thought about what I was going to ask him. <laughs> but I knew I wanted to meet him. I was so enraptured with his books. And, and so then I said, um, I, I need some advice. <laughs> and, um, and he said, I'm sorry, I, I don't see anybody. <laughs> and I said, I know. <laughs> Everybody tells me that. And then I proceeded to explain, I've read everything you've written. I really, I just, you know, I've, th this has been, this is a grail quest for me. I've been trying, he says, Finally, you know, he says, well, I've, I've got to get back to work now. Um, but since you seem to have made me your hobby, <laughs> I suppose you could come by late Friday afternoon. And I did. And for the next eight years, uh, we got together whenever we could. And he advised me on everything. And I didn't even know what I was, you know, he, he was uh, the one who kept me from leaving medical school between the second and the third year to go off to the London School of Economics and get a degree in Samizdat literature, which I had sort of schemed up. And uh, he explained to me, stay here, become a doctor. They let doctors do anything. <laughs> so anyway, I want to tell you two stories today. One story is about memory. And the other story, since after all, this is my penance for having been selected for this prestigious educational award, is about education and will be particularly about mentorship. Some of you know I'm a neuropsychiatrist and I've spent the bulk of my career trying to understand the little I can about brain function and distilling it down into a form that can be understood by my patients and my students. Now, in the past few years, I've been struck by the scourge of middle-age word-finding problems. How many of you have had the experience 
of talking about something that you remembered yesterday and you just can't find the word and you're trying to explain it. How many, how many people have had that experience? And then you go home and you like talk to your spouse and you're both trying to think of the word and one of you says, it's a short word. And the other, it's, it's, it, it reminds me of the place we used to live. And, and the word is gone. And then, and then the next morning you're going out to get the paper and you think, oh, that's what it was. It comes back to you and you can't figure out why it comes back to you. Let's see. Does anybody know what this is? What is it? It's a madeleine, right? So uh, this is a little French uh, baked good called a madeleine. Um, and the madeleine was one of the central characters in the novel that we all intend to read someday, but probably no one has ever read, Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. The protagonist in his story visits his mother, he visits his mother or an aunt, I think it is, um, and is given a cup of tea and a madeleine and tastes the madeleine crumbs and then comes back to him decades, from decades before, a little village he was in in his childhood and then the whole story comes from that taste. He couldn't remember those things but for the body memory or the automatic memory or some people call it sensory memory of having that taste and it brought back things that he couldn't voluntarily bring back to memory. Now this is an Eastern European Jewish pastry called teglach. It comes out at the Jewish high holidays. And this is my madeleine. Because when I taste this, I remember things that I could never remember from my childhood. It's a sensory memory, a body memory. This is Matteo Ricci. In 1596, Matteo Ricci went to China and taught the Chinese how to build memory palaces. His notion was that the one thing that he knew that Chinese scholars um, you know, uh, valued tremendously was the ability to have at their fingertips tremendous amounts of information. And if he could teach them a trick, to learn tremendous amounts of information, he could then convert them to Christianity. That was his goal. <laughs> the memory palace that he taught was the notion that, for those of you who are not familiar with this, the idea is that you create a space in your mind and you decorate it in a particular way. And within that space, you put things you're trying to remember. This is an ancient technique. Um, it goes back, it is said, to the Greek poet Simonides. Um, Simonides, it is said, was at a sumptuous banquet, very crowded around a banquet table with a lot of people. He was feeling like he wanted to go out for some air. He went outside the building, and while he was there, a storm that had been brewing blew up, a tremendous wind blew, and the building collapsed. He was the only survivor, it said, and he was outside. No one knew who was at the banquet, because everyone perished who was inside. And so they said, we want to notify the families. How are we going to figure out who this was? And Simonides says, I think I can help you. And he, va he visualized in his mind the banquet table and proceeded to said, he proceeded to name all of the people in the order they were seated around the table. And Simonides is credited with this whole notion of the memory palace. And, and uh, the notion is you, you take either an imaginary building or maybe a building you're familiar with and maybe you add a few rooms onto it and you, uh, you store things in your mind um, that you couldn't otherwise find. And um, uh, especially before the printed book, people memorized tremendously long treatises and, and this was a technique they used. Now, this is a palace of learning. It's, not the memory palace, you might recognize this as the building we're in. If you ever have a chance to see this building, the Sherman, um, the Sherman Center at sunset, it really is truly magnificent at sunset, especially the view out at sunset, it's, it's spectacular. Um, now, this is the entrance to Blackstone House. I'm one of the specialty advisors of Blackstone House, so forgive me for people who are in other houses here, but uh, um, I'm going to take you into Blackstone House. Now, 
the way our curriculum is uh, divided up in the, in the new curriculum for the medical school, the medical students are all part of houses. I believe there are five different houses. And they learn in these houses. And this new building has fabulous spaces for the learning communities. I mean, fabulous. You can peek in the windows on your way out here and see the kind of spaces they have equipped with everything you would need um, for learning. It's really, really spectacular. And my guess is, of anyone in this room, Chancellor Collins probably knows every inch of this building. Is that a fair assumption? OK. I'm going to take you inside the Blackstone quarters just to make sure that you caught this part of the building. You've seen this part, right? OK, good. <laughs> Let's take a walk in. This is the Hall of Mentors. It actually just exists in my mind, and I thought I'd give you a little peek at it. In my mind, I have a little bit of a memory palace where I keep my mentors. Let's see here. Am I caught on something? We've got to go this way. Ah, there we are. Got to go down the steps. And I want to introduce you to some of my first mentors. This is um, my father, Dr. Stanley Benjamin, and his father, Aaron Benjamin. This is a picture um, taken just after he received his MD from Ohio State University. His dad worked at a steel, uh, steel mill, Timken Roller Bearings uh, plant in Canton, Ohio. And this actually appeared as an advertisement in the local newspaper, more or less along the lines that if you work at this place, your son could be a doctor like this guy. <laughs> so. Um, I want to just say a word about what I've learned from some of my mentors. My father was a very remarkable primary care physician in many ways. And all through my medical schooling, I was waiting to meet someone else who thought this way. But he was all about differential diagnosis. He would torture himself at night reading and reading about problems that he couldn't solve. When a patient passed away whom he wasn't certain of the diagnosis in, he would try his best to get a post-mortem examination. And then he would go to the pathology lab, and he would always attend the post-mortem examination of every one of his patients. If one of his patients had a biopsy done, he would go to the lab and have the pathologist show him what he was talking about in the microscope. He was very, very interested in diagnosis. Now, you've already had the chance to uh, hear about my mother, who's here today. And uh, my mother was a social worker. And I would say what I've taken from her is a sense of justice and fairness. If you need something, my mother will figure it out and make sure that you get your due, even if the rest of the world is ignoring you. Now, seated here on this horse, it's my big brother and me. Um, my brother, Jerry, who uh, is also uh, here today, uh, who in addition to uh, teaching me equestrian skills, this, uh, this is probably in the late 1950s, I'm guessing. Um, in addition to that, I would say that what I've learned from Jerry is three things. Think big, take risks, and remember the people. But there's more teachers in my life. My wife, Miriam. Miriam was a dance teacher. Everyone in my family was teaching something. Um, Miriam was a folk dance teacher, and she was the uh, chaplain, the Jewish chaplain at MIT for 28 years. And I learned a good deal when I was residency training director about how to manage groups of people and how to do some certain things about counseling that they didn't teach me in psychiatry from my interactions uh, with Miriam, who, parenthetically, She's retired now for a few years. Her job in retirement is she runs a circus. I'm not kidding. It's not a metaphor. She actually is the president of an international youth circus. And our kids here. Uh, on the right is our daughter, Malka. And if you've ever been to Plymouth Plantation, Malka lives in the year 1627, where she is Mary Warren and interacts with tourists all day long to teach them about 17th century life. And what I've learned from her is every type of learner 
can learn things, but you have to adapt your lesson to the type of learner. I have watched her teach, and it is something magnificent. Everybody in the room gets involved. On the left is our son, Rafi. He is much better at me than interact at interacting with a large crowd. Rafi actually was in a circus himself, in the one that my wife's now president of. Um, when he was uh, in high school and college, he uh, appeared in uh, Circus Smirkus, and he's done a lot of, uh, uh, of circus uh, skills type of things since then. And he's criticized me before when he's seen me in, in front of a group, because he used to be a street performer, and he sort of knows how to gather people in. So I've had a lot of mentoring on those things in my family. Now, if we move over here, you'll see two people here at the medical school who live in my hall of mentors who've taught me much about teaching. On the right is Dr. Gagliardi, who has allowed me to participate in her class for many years and has given me little hints about what level the students are on and what, you know, where to pitch things at. And sometimes she'll be there in the class and interact with the students and model how you interact with students. Um, we should all watch what she's got. The other picture is of Dr. Mylan Rogoff. Mylan might have been one of the first people to ask me to teach here uh, because she was the associate residency training director in the 80s when I joined the faculty. But in addition, she, of course, runs the uh, medical student second year course in psychiatry, which is now called the brain course. And Mylan has invited me to teach in that course for many, many years. Now, each year we get feedback from the students so it really, it's not rocket science. If you do this for 20-some years, you mess up completely the first few years. You get feedback that says you messed up. Here's what you did wrong. You just read it, and you just do the other thing the next year. And gradually, 20 times, you mess up, and eventually, you know, the students kind of teach you how to do things. And Mylan very gently will say, this is great. Why don't you do this? And just, uh, she's, Mylan is a master of interacting with a classroom and uh, if you ever get a chance to watch her, I've learned a number of skills from her as well. Now, on this wall are my five associate training directors in the last 18 years. Um, the current one on the lower right is uh, uh, Dr. Fleming Ives. Um, and each of my associate training directors has been very good at reminding me to come back to Earth, remember where the residents are, don't be so overbearing. Don't be so particular. They're good. They're good. So, uh, so my associate training directors are, are what keep our program, I think, so human. And then there's our faculty. This is taken at last year's faculty retreat. This year's faculty retreat actually ended a few hours ago, so I couldn't get the picture into this in time. Uh, but. Uh, I am able to do some of the teaching I do because our faculty have created an environment where it's a group of people clearly dedicated to clinical excellence, to creating a scholarly environment, and to advocacy on behalf of their patients, and to modeling what you do with clinical trainees. So I look to them constantly for inspiration, but there's more. We've got to go over here. And we have over on this wall Dr. Deb Field and Dr. Yael Devere, who run our clerkship and who tell me all the time where the mind of the third year medical student is and to do my thing but to tone it down, you know, and to, um, uh, and, and they just, they just know um, how to relate uh, to that group and have taught me much. And over here, I don't know we talk enough about this, but one of the uh, groups of people whom we all learn tremendous amounts from is our support staff, and I don't have enough photos in my computer of putting them all there, but uh, Denise Barrett, who's pictured on the upper left, has been uh, the uh, administrative assistant to our chair for all the chairs I've served under, and Vicki White in the middle, our coordinator, and Cindy Snell on the right, and there's our other training staff uh, uh, below there. The support staff will whisper in your ear when you're about to do something terrible and say, you, you might want to just, you might want to just do it this way. Or, or, you know, if you talk to them this way, you could, you know, they know how the university runs, they know how the medical center runs, and if you ask them, they can teach you a tremendous amount about surviving in an institution like this. And then, these are my, uh, the three department chairs I've served under, 
and uh, you'll see Dr. Aaron Lazar, Dr. Paul Applebaum, and our current department chair, Dr. Doug Zadonis. The role of a department chair, after all, is to keep the funding flowing and to make sure research is going on. Um, but the role, in my mind, of the department chair is to stand for certain principles that the department agrees on and enable me to create an educational environment based on those. Um, and I have to say, I've been very fortunate that I've worked for chairs who've mentored me and who have my back and who are willing to stand up for the principles that allow us to teach. Now let me introduce you to the main mentors in my life. We'll go down. Oh, there's Hippocrates. Look at that. Let's go. First, I want to just go back to Gus. Unfortunately, all three of these people have passed away. So Gustav Eckstein was a neurophysiologist, and he was very interested in psychoanalysis. You begin to see where I'm going here. Um, and uh, uh, in our meetings, he would talk about the connections between history. He knew a lot about history and literature, and also neurophysiology, neuroscience. And he invited me to come with him after knowing him for a few years to the Cincinnati Psychoanalytic Institute would hold monthly meetings with excellent desserts at people's <laughs> homes where we would read a book and then talk about the biography of the author and try to figure out why is this person writing this at this time in their life? What was it about their psychology? And we'd go, somebody would prepare a formal report on the author and then Dr. Eckstein would speak and he would usually know the author. So, for instance, we talked about Sinclair Lewis. He knew Sinclair Lewis. Um, Gus worked in, uh, he, he, he knew an amazing number of people and would tell me these stories about them. So, Gus also um, was very pleased to see that I had come here to Boston. So, I, we used to, believe it or not, we used to write letters to one another when we weren't seeing one another here. Let me just turn this so you can see the letter head on. There we go. And um, in, in those, this is you know, obviously pre-computer. And uh, I had written to him that I had arrived in Boston uh, for residency, and I happened to be in Harvard Square, and lo and behold, they had his most recent book on the table at the Harvard bookstore. And he was writing back to me uh, in response to that. Your letter on this hot day sends ripples of cool over me. You said the right thing. A stack of the abridgment in a bookstore in Harvard Square. You cannot yet know what Harvard Square and Harvard have meant to me. The shy nights I had there in the square. My stay was cut short by World War I. Maybe that made the memories more persistent. I'm glad you are in Boston, settled, and of course not settled. Life is, must be, a low-grade, variously stimulating anxiety. Uh, now, there is almost no video of Gustav Eckstein. By the way, if you've ever seen, have anyone uh, ever seen the play The Man Who Came to Dinner or the movie? So The Man Who Came to Dinner includes an eccentric professor who visits Sheridan Whiteside, who's actually, Sheridan Whiteside is actually Alexander Wolcott, who is a friend of Eckstein's. And the professor, the eccentric professor is um, Professor Metz, and he brings Sheridan Whiteside a tank, a terrarium full of cockroaches uh, and a stethoscope hooked to them. And that was Gustav Eckstein being portrayed in The Man Who Came to Dinner. He did things like that. Well, there are almost no, uh, the, there are, as far as I can ascertain, there are only two videos in existence of Dr. Eckstein. I've really worked to try to find one. because For those of you in the room who have who've been my students, this is your grand mentor. Um, so he's being interviewed in this little clip. It's a very short clip. He's being interviewed by my radiology professor, Ben Felsen. Both of them have passed away. And um, uh, there's one other clip of him, and that's on the Today Show, and he's promoting a book. And the Today Show informed me that they would love to give it to us if the medical school would pay them $1,000 an hour for research to find it. So I decided to go for, for this one. Anyway, I'm going to let you get a look at Gustav, a very short clip of Gustav Eckstein talking with Ben Felsen. And Gus's uh, life companion is, is there with him, too. Sure or not, somebody said that you used to sit in the gallery at the symphony and it's over on the, uh, it was the peanuts were after you ate the peanuts. Could that be true? No, that isn't true. That isn't true. That was That's another just story. a filthy they, story. <laughs> they also <laughs> said you always wore your corduroy suit to the... Uh, well, I wore the corduroy suit, yes. That's right. Now, I remember yeah. you, you wore that suit yeah. for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> How polite you are, How Dr. Years Phil. Did you say, <laughs> and there's another thing. I never saw this. Yeah. But when they took you off in the, in the school play, the junior play, remember? 
they had the, the, dressed in the corduroy, I forgot the name of the guy who did you, but he had a parrot on his shoulder and yeah. the droppings from the parrot down his back. Yeah. Did you ever walk around the medical school with a parrot on your shoulder? Oh yes, I did, but the droppings down the back are not true for this reason. The paw of the parrot, it was my car, was so clean and discreet that she wouldn't have defecated down my back. And constipated, <laughs> obviously. She was fine. <laughs> fine, fine for her. Now, now, that was Gus, and he was just a very, very memorable character. One of the thrills of my life is when we spoke together at my medical school graduation. Now, at the top of this um, hall of mentors, you see Norman Geshwind. Norman Geshwind is considered the father of American behavioral neurology, the part of neurology that focuses on focal brain function and dysfunction. When I was an intern, uh, the psychiatry residency program I was at at Tufts placed me over to do my neurology at the behavioral neurology unit at the Boston VA for two months. And during that time, Dr. Geshwind would come over from the Beth Israel and round with us several times a week. And I'd watch him examine patients. And finally, at the end of the two months, I cornered him and said, Dr. Geshwind, I want to be your behavioral neurology fellow. I was a psychiatry resident. I said, can a psychiatrist be a behavioral neurology fellow? And, and he said, well, yes, I suppose, but you'd get so much more out of it if you also studied neurology. And so it was Norman that convinced me to do a neurology residency after my psychiatry residency in order to take his fellowship, and he had the temerity to pass away just before I started my fellowship. But I did have the opportunity for six years to attend his rounds, um, his aphasia rounds. And I just want to play you a quick little um, uh, tape of him examining a patient so you can get an idea. You know what a leopard is? Yeah. You know what a lion is? Right. So the leopard was killed by the lion. Which animal died? I don't know. Um, That's hard, is it? No, no, no. Uh, I don't know. Uh, what animal died? I don't know. You don't know what animal died? Right. Obviously, that's got to be an error in, in understanding the grammar. So, Dr. Geshwind was an aphasiologist. And then, um, in front of you, and, and from Dr. Geshwind, I really learned how to carefully examine a patient. And below Dr. Geshwind is Dr. Edith Kaplan, who's considered, by the way, she's a graduate. She got her PhD at Clark University here in Worcester. She's con she was considered the foremost proponent of the process approach to neuropsychology. It's the type of neuropsychology that is less worried about the score the patient gets and more worried about why they got there. And Edith gave her last lecture here at UMass in 2002. I could not find any good videos of Edith teaching, but I found one little clip done at UMass that I'll show you. Um, uh, I studied with Edith for many years, and I used to bring Edith here to teach the residents every few years and would introduce, uh, would introduce her as uh, sort of their grandmother, sort of speaking. Um, she passed away in 2009, unfortunately, and actually became ill. She was supposed to come out and give grand rounds that year and became ill that day and then over a few months deteriorated. Um, we were going to have an 85th birthday party for her when she came out. It was a surprise thing. So um, uh, what she's talking about here is the draw a clock test in this video. Uh, some of you know I run a draw a clock contest every year to help residents learn more about cognitive assessment. And uh, here she is just explaining it a little. And you have a problem with time. <laughs> OK. Um, now, we uh, started uh, at the VA uh, asking patients to draw uh, a clock, an analog clock, uh, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, there are aspects to a clock that we're going to focus on individually. Drawing a clock is a multifactorial test. It's not an either or kind of thing. It's not that you get it right or you get it wrong, uh, but there are many, many different uh, 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 many, many uh, 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 different areas of the brain that are contributing to the uh, production uh, of a clock. Okay. Well, it's been fun being here, but uh, let's go back up and leave this room, which, oh, there we go. And 
We may come back later. Mentors are said to have all sorts of characteristics that are very important to the mentorship. And, and funny thing, one of them I've always heard was something about um, uh, being open and, and receptive. Have any of you had, how many of you are aware that you had an important mentor in your life? How many of you have had a mentor? The majority of people in the room. And did you ever have one who was demanding and rigid and not open at all, but was a good mentor? How many people have had a demanding, rigid mentor? You don't have to be completely open and all that to, to, um, to be a good mentor, but you have to insist on certain things, right? This is a study just published about a month or two ago um, that's the largest study of, um, uh, of mentor-mentee pairs uh, in academic medicine that's come out. And uh, they said that mentors basically are um, uh, best, the best rated ones are altruistic, active listeners, honest even if it hurts, that is saying when something's a bad idea, of course experienced, and accessible even though they're busy. Now, what does that mean? Can you knock on their door? Well, uh, their good mentors are ones who also answer you by email or by, you know, they somehow get in touch with you. But mentees are rated by their mentors, and a good mentee is one who's open, who's an active listener, him or herself, is respectful of time and advice, doesn't necessarily follow the advice given, but at least takes it into account and really drives the relationship. Maybe not to the point of stalking like I've done in my life, but. <laughs> but drives the relationship. Don't stalk. Don't stalk. Um, and it's said that successful mentoring relationships depend on reciprocity, mutual respect, very clear expectations in both directions, chemistry, not necessarily friendship, but chemistry, where you can really work together, and a set of shared values that you agree on. Why is the memory of a mentor so powerful? I believe that it has to do with what I call emotional valence. Valence, you're, you know, in chemical charges, has to do with the charge of an ion. But, but, um, but emotional valence is the emotional charge of a thought or a memory. And it's not so much what a mentor has told you, but what you take from the experience, sort of like the Madeleine and the body memory of childhood. It's the emotional memory of the relationship that carries you forward. What's the, the valence of the relationship? Now I'll ask you the question, what if we all had perfect recall? What would that be like? What if our memories were perfect? Some people are thinking, this sounds great. Some people are thinking, uh-oh. Um, so the human brain can theoretically hold the equivalent of two and a half petabytes of data. That would be if every neuron was engaged in, uh, long, in, in voltage changes that led to learning. How much is a petabyte? We don't usually talk in those terms. but. Um, a megabyte can hold maybe a 500-page book in text, and a gigabyte, perhaps a 20-minute video. You know a DVD has 4.7 gigabytes on it. A terabyte might be the size of the backup drive you have on your desktop. A terabyte can hold 60 stacks of paper the height of the Eiffel Tower in it, um, or 200,000 songs. A petabyte is 1,000 terabytes, OK? So a petabyte is a lot of data. How many of you have ever had a TV binge where you've really watched, especially the younger people in the room, what's the most number of hours you've ever watched television? Two? Twelve. Twelve hours. OK. I can't imagine it. But, but <laughs> two and a half petabytes is enough space that you could store 300 million hours of television. That's all of the television that would be broadcast, not in HD, for 300 years. In theory, if we could figure out how to store in our brains, we could store that much data. That would be enough room to put 25% of the entire Library of Congress's print and media collection, including all the digital media and everything else. Right now, the largest capacity computer disk array that I could find holds 120 petabytes and can hold all of the communications, books, and media in the world. Okay. Now, DNA, in theory, can store more data than any known technology. It hasn't been exploited yet, but in theory it can. So this was just published in Nature just a short time ago, in February. Look up the article. It's absolutely fascinating. So DNA 
The, simple, the, the simplistic idea here is DNA is a series of chemical base pairs that are actually code, and it's the code that we talk about that's within um, genes. And these chemical base pairs tell the body what to manufacture to put together into the products of, of genes. And it's, it's four different types of base pairs. And using those four different types of base pairs, you can design a mathematical code that can encode computer data. And you can record in the DNA, in a, in a matter of speaking. So we can synthesize DNA in a laboratory. And if you synthesize the DNA, not according to known proteins in the uh, human genome, but according to a mathematical formula that's digitizing the material, it turns out you can make data recordings in synthetic DNA. So as a proof of concept, this group of researchers recorded in audio all 154 of Shakespeare's sonnets translated them into synthetic DNA with multiple copies, dried it and put it in a little test tube, mailed the test tube to the other side of the world where they put it in a sequencer. They read the DNA, converted it back, and listened to an audio recording of Shakespeare's sonnets. This was done just in the last few months. In theory, if DNA were totally exploited, its capacity would be 455 exobytes per gram. An exabyte is 1,000 petabytes. Remember, we were talking about 2.5 petabytes before. Seven grams of DNA, the size of a quarter of a small granola bar, <laughs> could hold all of the information on all of the media in the world, including all of the information on all of the hard drives in the world, and all the memory backups, and everything else, all the electronic communications. Absolutely everything could be contained in seven grams, in theory. This has nothing to do with what I was talking about, but I thought it was so cool that I would just tell you. <laughs> Let's go back to memory palaces. This is, this is Sir Francis Bacon. And Sir Francis Bacon, who was never known to keep his opinions to himself, um, really thought that memory palaces, which were all the rage in his day, were completely ridiculous um, as mnemonic devices. Castles in the air. He said, he described them of ostentation prodigious, but fundamentally barren. Strangeness without worthiness. For he said, you can certainly memorize tremendous amounts of information, but show me how you can use it productively. And that's the major criticism of memory palaces. This book, some of you might have read by Joshua Foyer, uh, that came out a few years ago, Moonwalking with Einstein, where he learns the mnemonic techniques, figures out how you memorize large lists of cards and memorize pi to all these digits. And he does this, and in the, in the book he also concludes, you know, I now have the ability to learn tremendous piles of playing cards and things I can remember them. But it hasn't changed one iota my ability to use what I know in common discourse or in solving problems. And that's what Sir Francis Bacon was saying. What would be the cost of perfect recall? This is Jorge Luis Borges, um, who um, wrote a short story which I commend to you called Funius the Memorius, is the translated uh, version of it. Now, it's fictional. Funius, in theory, had a traumatic brain injury at age 19, and after that point was cursed with the ability to remember everything. His memory was perfect from that time. And, Fun and, and Borges had tremendous insight into what it would be like to have perfect recall. He, Funius was bothered by the fact that we would use the same name for a dog at 314 seen from the side as we would call a dog at 315 seen head on. Why would it have the same name? Since to him, he had stored them as two different memories, and they were completely different. And Funius would just turn away from people and sleep facing the wall when he tried to sleep because he didn't want to record any memories. That was so painful to keep recording memories. He was tortured by his memory. Fictional, fictional. In real life, this is Kim Peek. Kim Peek is the real life person who was the inspiration for the Rain Man in the Dustin Hoffman movie. Kim Peek actually did not have autism, although he's, the Rain Man is portrayed as if he did. He had a different kind of related condition. But Kim Peek was both a calendar savant. He could tell you any, you know, a calendar savant can always tell you exactly what day of the week any date in history happened. Um, he could also remember perfectly the details of 12,000 books he'd read, any detail in any of the books. Now, um, I see uh, Dr. Tonkanogi in the back of the room. And uh, Dr. Tonkanogi knew the great Russian neuropsychologist Alexander Luria. Alexander Luria wrote a book about a real person named Solomon Shetoshevsky. Um, the book was called The Mind of a Nemonist. 
Solomon Shereshevsky came to him because he got in trouble at work. He was working as a journalist. How did he get in trouble? He wasn't taking notes during an important meeting. He didn't know you had to take notes. He had perfect recall of everything that happened in every meeting. So he was surprised to find out that he was required to take notes. Um, he would lose jobs, but he had this perfect recall. So he came to Luria, and Luria tested him and tested him. It turns out Shereshevsky was a synesthete. He had synesthesia. For him, everything he knew was represented not only as a word, but as a color, as a sound, as a spatial location. He couldn't look at a word without it glowing in color to him. It had a smell. It had a taste. And it's said that his perfect recall had to do with the fact that he recorded everything in a multisensory fashion. He had a normal IQ. It was not elevated. And metaphor was a mystery to him. He had this tremendous, tremendous ability, but he couldn't exist in the, word of meta in the world of metaphor. So it's rather concrete. It's my contention that emotional valence or limbic valence, emo that is the emotional value of, some th of a memory, aids the memory. In traumatic events, we use the term flashbulb memory to indicate some thing that's brilliantly burned into our, uh, into our memory because it was such a dramatic event in our lives. So flashbulb memory contains within it the details that are much, much more detailed than anything we normally recall. And some of you, if you've ever been in a life-threatening experience, remember that time seemed to go slow during it because you actually recorded more information than you do when you're not having an emotionally traumatic experience. And it seems to go slow. The brain stores both the data and the emotional importance of the data. Without emotional importance, without emotional valence, we would not be changed by our memories. You could say that we are our memories in many ways. We live in our memory. We, our experiences add up to who we are. Let's do a little experiment. All of you, I think, have a flashbulb memory of 9-11. Probably most of you saw the TV on the day the World Trade Center was attacked. Is that a pretty safe bet? And how many of you remember the video of the first plane flying into the World Trade Center? Hold your hands up. How many of you remember it? Look around the room, everyone. Take a look around the room. The first plane that flew into the World Trade Center was not shown on television until the next day. Three quarters of the people in the room believe that they saw that. Flashbulb memory is vast. It sticks. It's not necessarily always accurate. Okay. What would happen if you had no emotional connection to a memory? The Capgras delusion describes someone's feeling that a close person, say their spouse or parent or child, has been replaced by an imposter, an exact double, but an imposter. And the person feels that although this person is doing a very good job of representing, say, my wife, I know they're not my wife. It's torture for the family when this happens. One of our uh, neuropsychiatry residents, Dr. DeGrush, who's here today, is following somebody, uh, following a couple where the wife suffers from this terrible, terrible delusion. And imagine the husband's feeling when he's spending his entire life caring for her and she says, I know you say you're my husband. Imagine how that feels. It cuts into the person. If there's no emotional valence, the person doesn't feel familiar. She recognized the face but says, that's not him. Now, what if we had no ability to remember whatsoever? This is H.M., the most famous neuropsychiatric case in history. We now know his name to be Henry Malayason, who died a couple of years ago in Connecticut. H.M. had a surgery for epilepsy similar to the one we do here at UMass, but he had it done on both sides to stop his seizures. They removed the anterior medial temporal lobes. And as a matter of fact, uh, I can show you here is a reconstruction of his brain, and you can see the part in red is what they removed. And HM uh, had absolutely no ability to record new memories. He was a very pleasant fellow. He got along very well with people, but he couldn't remember anything new. He had 20 seconds of working memory, and he had a retrograde amnesia. Couldn't remember anything that happened two years before his surgery either. He lived until his 80s, and really enjoy, he seemed to enjoy life. Uh, and uh, Brenda Milner spent her entire career studying HM. And uh, from him, 
We learned that you never operate on both sides of the temporal lobe in the same patient. We learned that. But we also learned a lot about the nature of memory. Now, chronic alcohol abuse can produce something called Korsakoff psychosis, which is the same almost as what HM has. No new memories whatsoever are laid down after it begins. So here it is, standing on one foot. How does the brain remember? Now, those of you who are in neuroscience here, pardon me, but this is just, you know, this is kind of the way it works. We put a thought in working memory, which is where these two pink spots are, we think, someplace in the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. And then the hippocampus, which is this sort of seahorse-shaped thing in the, where the arrows are pointing to in this coronal, like sliced bread image of the brain. Um, we put it in the hippocampus. The hippocampus consolidates it and sends it to somewhere in the brain where it's going to keep it, and it keeps a map of where it sent it. And then we think where it puts most long-term memories is someplace in the temporal lobes in association cortex. That's called declarative memory, memory for information. That's the way we think it works. But HM could still learn new motor skills even though he had no hippocampus. It had been surgically removed. Long-term motor memory is a whole other thing than declarative memory. Procedural memory is very different. Your basal ganglia, the parts in the middle of your brain, learn how to ride a bicycle. Then they teach it to your cerebellum. And your cerebellum remembers how to ride a bicycle for the rest of your life. Regardless of alcoholism or anything else, it never forgets motor memory. Autobiographical memory is totally different from that. It's different than memory for facts as well. Autographic, autobiographical memories are always stronger when they have more emotional impact, emotional valence. There's the Proust book showing up there. This is a case reported a few years ago of AJ, who had an incredible autobiographic memory. She's being studied at University of Southern California. Turns out her memory is only average when tested for anything else, but she remembers every day in her life. And you can tell her a date all the way back to when she was a teenager. She's now in her 40s. She'll tell you what she was wearing. She'll tell you who she met. She'll tell you what they had for dinner. They've studied it. They've verified with other people. She has eidetic memory only for events in her own life. Totally normal otherwise. And she can't really use memory to learn. She just is blessed with that particular strength. The memory of a mentoring relationship is much more about autobiographical memory than it is about declarative memory. It's the experience you had. Now, the last thing I'll tell you about the science of memory is that memory can change your neurons. We think that experience is encoded in memory by a voltage change called long-term potentiation, where one neuron fires away, neuron A, it's firing against neuron B, and if you do this long enough, neuron B learns to fire much more efficiently. That's called long-term potentiation. We think that's how the brain remembers. And neuron B can keep its sensitivity for many, many years, and you can get it to fire very easily. Now, memory can also change our brains, not just our neurons. You might recognize this as a string of London taxi cabs and a map of London. To get a taxi license, a cab license in London, you have to pass a test called the knowledge. You have to learn every street within six miles of Charing Cross Station. That's 25,000 streets, and you have to be able to recall 20,000 landmarks. It takes two to four years to study for a cab license in London. Very few people succeed. There is a scientist in the UK who's been studying the memory of people who've passed the knowledge and has clearly demonstrated in a 10-year series of experiments that the posterior hippocampus, that part in the deep medial anterior temporal lobe of of these cab drivers who've successfully passed the knowledge. The posterior part grows in size if they successfully pass the knowledge. As long as they drive, it stays bigger. Bus drivers who drive fixed routes don't enlarge their hippocampus. But taxi drivers who have to be creative and know all this spatial connections, theirs grows. If they retire, it shrinks. Nemonists, people who are known for memory, memorizing large things and things, large groups of numbers and things, their hippocampi don't grow. Remembering can also be painful. Of course, traumatic memory is well known. It can be intense and long-lasting. I showed you that it can be inaccurate, but it can feel very true to someone. And when we recall a memory, we can reconsolidate and change it. And sometimes that produces false memory syndrome. But it's also sometimes how we change and help people in psychotherapy. On the other hand, not remembering, as we know, can be very painful. And, of course, there's what I suffer from, the word-finding issues of middle age. Some dementias, not all, um, uh, feature painful not remembering. Some dementias, you don't actually remember that you don't remember, and it's not that painful. It depends on the type of dementia. 
But it's very interesting that even in people with Alzheimer's disease, the feeling of familiarity can persist. So all of you have known someone with Alzheimer's disease. Have you had the experience where it's very clear from their emotional expression that, they, that they're familiar with you? They can't place your face, but they, they, you can tell by the change in their body that they're familiar. So in that case, the emotional valence persisted, but the memory was lost. Traumatic brain injury is often associated with retrograde amnesia, losing the memory for a few minutes, weeks, months before the uh, accident. And every patient whom I've ever seen with retrograde amnesia is convinced that they would feel better if they could bring that memory back. They are convinced that their life has been ruined by the loss of those few minutes or hours. And we can never bring the retrograde amnesia back. It shrinks a little. Dr. Geshwin used to say it called it a shrinking retrograde amnesia. But you can never bring it back. I thought I'd play you a poem by my absolute favorite poet, Billy Collins, about forgetfulness and what it's like. Forgetfulness. The name of the author is the first to go, followed obediently by the title, the plot, the heartbreaking conclusion, the entire novel, which suddenly becomes one you have never read, never even heard of. It is as if one by one the memories you used to harbor decided to retire to the southern hemisphere of the brain to a little fishing village where there are no phones. Long ago, you kissed the names of the nine muses goodbye and you watched the quadratic equation pack its bag. And even now, as you memorize the order of the planets, something else is slipping away, a state flower, perhaps, the address of an uncle, the capital of Paraguay. Whatever it is you are struggling to remember, it is not poised on the tip of your tongue, not even lurking in some obscure corner of your spleen. It has floated away down a dark mythological river whose name begins with an L, as far as you can recall, <laughs> well on your own way to oblivion, where you will join those who have forgotten even how to swim and how to ride a bicycle. No wonder you rise in the middle of the night to look up the date of a famous battle in a book on war. No wonder the moon in the window seems to have drifted out of a love poem that you used to know by heart. But memory can also be therapeutic. We compare ourselves with our mentors. Psychoanalysts use a concept they call the ego ideal. And by that, they mean that as you grow up, you take the values of the people who you're closest with and who influenced you most, and you pack them together into a synthetic being in the back of your mind. And you go through the rest of your life comparing yourself to that thing you've created in your mind, the idealized ego. And to the extent that you compare well to that collection of favorite uncles and mentors and grandparents and whoever, you feel good about yourself. To the extent you don't measure up, you become depressed and lose self-esteem. Memory can also help us through hard times. How many of you have ever been through a difficult dental procedure or a test where you began to remember either words to songs or poems or something just to get yourself through it? Has anybody done that? Several? I've done that, I know. This is the ultimate. This is a guy I came to know in the uh, dissident movement named Vladimir Bukowski. Bukowski was arrested for co-authoring a book called A Manual on Psychiatry for Dissidents, How a Dissident Should Behave So as Not to Be Committed to a Soviet Psychiatric Hospital in the 1970s. They put him in solitary confinement in the gulag where he was in, three years in solitary confinement. How did he keep himself sane? He built a castle. He was an engineer. The first year, he spent a year planning the details of the castle and how many tons of block he would need and all of the different wiring and everything. The second year, he actually built the castle in his mind. And the third year, he decorated it. And then he was released from solitary, and he felt OK. He kept himself sane with that. Our collective memory also can be therapeutic. This is, of course, George Santayana, who said, anyone uh, who cannot remember the past is condemned to repeat it. We've all lived through a number of traumatic things that we think, as a people, we can prevent if we just remember them. Slavery, the Holocaust, genocides, things like that. We can put our memories together 
and, be thera and, and get therapy from that. And many psychotherapies use memory as a therapeutic tool. Don't underestimate the value of forgetting, however. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately. Nowadays, things are forever on the internet. And you, do, you just can't escape them. But we need to be able to forget. Jean Valjean in Les Miserables became the mayor of a town. He obtained great respect after the small petty crime he had created. But nowadays, and nowadays there's always an inspector Javert pursuing you because you've left tracks on the internet and you can never take them back. One does not simply just take it off Google. But as a people, we need to be able to forget to be healthy. Is memory becoming vestigial? We all carry memory devices with us. We carry all of our brains in our pocket. We have GPS. We have Dropbox. We have all these things. This is the iPhone 10. Um, and, and by the way, this dog is wearing Google Glass. And, um, uh, and I'm, you know, are you worried that memory is actually disappearing? So to summarize, I think we are defined by our memory. We should wish for a very good, but not a perfect memory. Perfect memory comes at tremendous cost. It's the emotional connection that embeds a memory most firmly in your psyche. And memory can actually change our neurons and change our brains, it's been proven. Which means that a mentor can change your neurons and change your brain if you have the right mentoring experience. And when we're not sure what to do, sometimes the memory of a mentor can carry us through. What would they have advised me? And you can be 90 years old and still remember your mentor and get yourself through a tough situation. So of course, they were all in the hippocampus uh, where our memory is. Let's just quickly, very quickly, take a trip back into Blackstone House for the other room that I forgot to show Chancellor Collins. So we're, we're back here. And since we're in a virtual world anyway here, let's turn around and go back up here. See, we don't actually have to walk around in a virtual world. We can jump and fly. <laughs> see that yellow door? It's got bubbles coming out. It looks very. Should we go into it and see what else is hidden in Blackstone? Do you want to go through the door? Are you a little afraid? I'm a little afraid. I'm hoping it works. Let's go through. Ah! No, it's coming. Wait. Oh, we've got to back up. Wait, wait, wait. Come back. Come back. Come back. Ah! Oh, no, 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 no. Wait, there, wait. There we go. We're through. Whew. Wow. So here we have the people who've actually taught me lined up in space. These are the medical students I've taught at UMass. There's a couple thousand of them over the years here. And um, these are the residents here. And we can just go right through them and into the circle of the residents I've taught here. Some of you may recognize people here. They're all here. And I also carry in my... Uh, Hall of Mentors, another group. Let's see here. Where did I put them? Uh, oh, there they are. They're over there. Let's just charge right through here. Here are the people who've been the 18 program chief residents I've worked with. Now, in the world of residency, the program chief resident is your confidential advisor, the one who tells you what not to do, tells you the way the residents are thinking, helps you prevent from your humiliating yourself. Um, and I have learned immeasurably from each of these program chief residents. So if you were one of my program chief residents, can you stand up? People who've been a program chief resident sometime here. Stay standing. Stay standing. If you are a resident in our program now, or you've ever been a resident in the past in our program, stand up. If you've ever been a medical student who has suffered through lectures from me, stand up. 
These are the people who I want to thank for teaching me how to teach. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, Dr. Benjamin, thank you very much for a, uh, a really terrific last lecture. I think Randy Posh, who sort of made the last lecture um, popular, would have been jealous. Um, <laughs> you know, when we have the opportunity to to experience great teaching. Um, we benefit greatly from it. And uh, I actually hope that my memory of this experience will be great, not good. <laughs> if you don't remember the details, you might remember the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and for that, we'll all be grateful. <laughs> Thank you again. Congratulations on this year's award. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.